Heritage, how you doing? Welcome to Heritage Church Online. My name is Michael. I'm one of the pastors here. This is Pastor Suzanne. We're glad you're here online with us whenever you happen to be watched. We're on Facebook Live, but you can be watching the recording later. There is a link in the comments, so please make sure you, if you haven't been here before, click on that. Fill out the connection card. Uh, and we are on Facebook Live, so interact, share. You can even do that later when it's not live. You can interact and share then. We'll answer your questions then. All the announcements of what's going on in the life of Heritage Church can be found on our website. You can check it out there. We are in the middle of our County Line Road concert series. It's a series we put on for our neighbors in the month of September. We've been running into some rain problems, haven't we? So make sure that you check out what's happening with that on our Facebook page before you head this way. Each and every month we do one thing to make a difference in our community. So we all work together to do something to make a difference for a local agency in our community that's making a difference. And one of those is New Futures. New Futures is a homeless shelter uh, for families where you can bring in your entire family and have a place to stay um, when you need it. And we, they, they have a list of things that they need. And one of the things that they've asked for is diapers and wipes. Mm. And so we'll be collecting diapers and wipes throughout the month of September. And we thank you for your support of that. You can just drop it off in the black bin out front if you're out around this area. And if you're not, you can uh, message us about how you might like to be a part of that. And then each and every month, we always have an opportunity to serve. And this month, this week's opportunity is that uh, you would have the opportunity to be part of helping taking care of our building. Now, it's a lot to take care of your house, isn't it? <laughs> it's a lot to take care of a building here. And so if you have any kind of skills that you would like to offer toward that, whether that be organization skills, whether it be uh, landscaping kind of skills, whether it be fix things, paint, whatever, if you'd like to be a part of the trustees, we'd love for you to be a part of that team. Yeah, trustees are critical for our church <laughs> to operate, for sure. We have a big honey-do list, so come on, be a part of or it. Or a honey-don't list. Honey-don't <laughs> list, yeah, yeah, it just <laughs> depends on who you are that day. Okay, so we're in the middle of our message series, Grow Up, and we're glad you're here with us on this because our world needs more grown-ups right now. It needs some mature people that can bring peace and calm and reason to a situation because it's been lacking that for a while. We did a, a class, a course at our church, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, uh, last year, and it was Pete Cesaro that wrote this, and Pete says this. He says, it is not possible to be spiritually mature without being emotionally mature. You know, if you're emotionally immature, you're not going to be spiritually mature. And we talked about how life is like an iceberg, and most of our emotional life is kind of under the surface, and so far under the surface sometimes that we don't even know ourselves. And so it's really important, we talked about one week, that we get to know our family of origin, how we got how we are, right? And and that sometimes when we get to emotional walls, that we learn how to go through those walls in order to grow. And then last week, if you were with us, we talked about how to grow on a daily basis closer to God. We talked about taking Sabbath, doing sabbaticals, how we need to slow down in order to speed up our relationship with God. And today, we're going to talk about a subject that kind of hits all of us, mm. grief and loss. Because it definitely affects our spiritual life. I mean, if we're going to grow spiritually, we need to understand a couple things. First of all, that we need to recognize that grief and loss is a part of life. And then secondly, we need to understand that spiritual transformation happens through grief and loss. You know, some people are fortunate. They've never experienced any big, huge griefs in their life. But if you live long enough, you're going to lose. You're going to suffer the loss of something, and grief comes to all of us, and it will humble you when it does. You know, the root word of, of humility is humus. It's a, it's a Latin word, and it means of the earth. And when you are being humbled through grief and loss, you feel like you're in the dirt because all illusion of control is gone. You know, in our culture, grief surrounds us. And, it, it, and, and a lot of times it happens to the other, and we look at it, and we view loss sometimes as unnatural, you know? And we'll do anything to go around it. We'll, we'll use avoidance. We'll use addiction. We'll, we'll use blame. We'll deny. We'll rationalize away our grief. Most of us would rather take a detour around our grief and our loss, <coughs> excuse me, and our sorrow. Today we're going to look at a book called the book of Job, and it's in the Old Testament, and it's in a section 
of, of Scripture that's called wisdom literature. Because Scripture is separated by genre, right? And this wisdom literature, the purpose of wisdom literature, is to help you question all the assumptions that you have, things that you just automatically decide in your head throughout life, and to help us grow up, right? That's what wisdom literature does. And this particular book, Job, looks at the age-old question of why does evil and suffering exist in our world? If you were looking at it theologically, the word is theodicy. It's also an object lesson on how to handle our grief and loss. And so I'm going to just paraphrase chapter 1 because it's the setup for the whole thing. You can go and read the book yourself. It's in the Old Testament, right near Psalms and Proverbs, all the other wisdom literature that's right there. In chapter 1, Job, it kind of starts out, Job is this amazing, godly man. And he is so devoted to God, but he's also devoted to his kids. He has ten children, seven sons, three daughters. And not just that, he's not just blessed that way. He has thousands upon thousands of livestock. In fact, he's one of the richest men of his time. And he has ranch hands to handle it all and servants to handle his estate. And he was, he was called in that time the greatest man among all in the East. And he was so devoted to God, he would even sacrifice on behalf of his kids, just in case they did something they didn't tell him about, right? In case they offended God. And so we get this setup of who Job is, and then it flashes up to heaven, to the heavenly court. And God's sitting, holding court, and angels are coming by. And Satan, evidently one of those angels, comes by, and he looks at God, and God says, what you been doing? Oh, you know, I've been hanging out. And God looks at me and says, what do you think about my servant Job? Isn't he a great guy? How devoted is he, huh? And Satan says, well, uh, yeah. Why wouldn't he be? I mean, you protect him. You bless it, everything for him. Look how rich he is. Look how great he is. Look how many kids he's got. He knows which side his bread is buttered on, God. Hey, what if you took all that away, God? Then he'd turn on you. I bet he would. And God looks at Satan, and he says, you know what? I'm going to remove my hand of protection from him, and you can touch him. Be yours. And in quick succession, Satan lays on from his soul a horrible grief and loss on Job. He lost every bit of his livestock in three separate incidents and all of his workers were killed off so his whole staff every bit of his riches is gone in one day and if that wasn't bad enough a natural disaster comes by and wrecks the house the children are in and it kills all the animals can you imagine the depth of that loss and and so job says this and, and, and he says, at this, Job got up when he heard all this news all at once. And he tore his robes, and he shaved his head, and he fell to the ground and worshipped. And he said, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. In all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. i got to tell you, he's a better man than I am. Okay? The truth is, we all face grief, loss, sorrow, and we have a choice when we suffer loss. To stay stuck in our grief and our pain and our regret, or to face all of these really, really hard emotions of grief and allow it to transform us into a new way of being. If we're going to grow up emotionally, and spiritually, then we need to learn to deal with our grief and loss. You know, if you think about the story of Job, is the story of all of all of us in mm. many ways. I mean, Job lost everything in one day, right. but we lose things over a lifetime. I mean, just think about all the losses that we experience in this life. We can lose our marriages. Someone can betray you, a spouse. We can lose our dreams. Maybe you wanted to be something when you grew up and you didn't get to do that. Or maybe you had dreams of your retirement. You lose that. Maybe you've struggled with the dream of, of in, you know, of having children. You've struggled with infertility. You've, you've struggled in your job and your career. You've struggled with your health. You've struggled with, with your home, even keeping a home and what you thought might be. I mean, we, we lose our routine sometimes, the pandemic. Yeah. And, and, and that's just the stuff of life that can happen. And and then, and then we lose relationships and family members. I mean, we lose our parents at one point, and not just 
to death, we lose our parents. Uh, who they were is they begin to age, and we have to care for them. We, we can lose our siblings. We can lose, as I said, our spouse. We can lose our kids, and God forbid that would happen in something, lose a, lose a child. How painful is oh, that? Oh. But we lose them in another way when they grow up and they're no longer in our That's house. That's too. And, and, we, and we lose our friends, and, and, and you know, not just friends who, you know, might, who might die. We lose friends who, who ghost us, who oh. were part of our lives and then aren't, and that's, that's such a painful thing in our lives. And, you know, we even lose things spiritually. As a Christian, it will one, at one point, we'll, we'll, we'll lose this, this understanding of what the church is because we look at the church, and the church isn't perfect, and the church doesn't meet our expectations, and, and we get disillusioned in our faith because the church isn't perfect, not understanding that the church is full of imperfect people, including ourselves. Yeah. And Michael and I always say when we meet you know, new people coming to the church, one of the first things that we say to them when we get to sit down and talk about being part of the church is say, you need to know this, we will fail you. We will That's fail us. you. We'll we're fail we're you. human beings, and human beings are icky, and we're messy, and we, you know, and we stumble. And you know, I had a wise counselor tell me one time, and you know, even, even pastors can get disillusioned with the church sometimes. And I had a wise counselor. I was talking with her about you know, just some things going on and, and church planning and where we are, and she said these words, and I thought, thought they were so powerful she said Suzanne the church is not God's you know we all handle grief differently I mean some people when they experience grief they're broken some are stoic some wear black some wear yellow you know mm -hmm. that story of the lady who wore yellow to the funeral and everybody was talking about why she wear yellow and kind of judging her and she wore it because that was her spouse's favorite color so she wore the yellow dress uh, some of us, when we lose somebody we love, we give away their possessions right away. Some of them, we keep them for years. Honestly, I, I, I would prefer to do a funeral over a wedding anyway, in, in any for day. Sure. Any day I would prefer that because at a, a funeral, people are seeking the presence of God. And we deal with pain, as Michael said. We, you know, when people drink, they use food, they use pills, they use work, anything to stop the pain. And sometimes we want other people to make our pain stop. We demand our spouse to make it stop, or our kids, or our career, or the church can take it away. And there's no other time in your life when your spirit is more in need and more open of the presence of God. No more important time. You know, Job had everything against him. He got boils on his body. He lost his family. He lost Bad. his home. He lost his riches. I mean, his wife even looked at him and said, can you imagine if I said this? Why don't you just curse God oh, and die? Thanks, God. You took everything and, except and his her. Friends, his friends tried to make it his fault. Yeah. It's a wonder Job never loses hope. But his response in the midst of that is one of, of hope because he had his God. And the Apostle Paul writes about that to us. In the New Testament, in the book of Thessalonians, the Apostle Paul writes, But we do not want you to be uninformed about those who are asleep, those who have died, so that you will not grieve as do the rest mm. who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. And there is some hope. You know, a lot of times when we look at grief and loss, we look at it as if we might not survive it. But honestly, we will. We will survive it. And nothing will help us grow up more than to be on the other side of grief and loss. Because see, on the other side, our sorrow turns to solace. As an example, the cross, the loss of the cross leads to resurrection. We must always remember that we don't grieve as those without hope. You see, if we're going to grow up, we must deal with our grief and loss. You know, bereavement's tough. I mean, that's when you lose something. That's what bereavement is. Something or someone. And spiritually mature people, and this is what this series is about, about growing up and becoming mature, they don't create defensive walls to shield them from that pain of loss. Le it's a, you know, it's a leader's job to define reality, and our job is to define reality in all of this. We all should be doing we all will experience grief and loss. And guess what? It is part. Mm -hmm. Two-thirds of the Psalms, also part of wisdom literature, are about lament. And when you talk about what lament is, it's a passionate expression of grief and loss. In fact, one of the Psalms, Psalm 6, says this. says, I am worn out from sobbing. All night I flood my bed with weeping, drenching it mm -hmm. with my tears. This is a part of our wisdom of our faith is that we're supposed to express that. But we don't always do that. 
you know, here's a question I want to ask everybody. You can answer this on Facebook Live. Please answer this in the comments. We'd love to hear what your answers are. The question is this. Why do people hide their grief and loss? Why do we hide it? Do you know why, Suzanne? Do you know? Do you know? I mean, it's like, why do we hide our grief and loss? Do you know why people hide it? Well, we're embarrassed. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's not... It's, um, you know, it's, it, it, we all want to put on that, that, that stoic front that we're handling it well, and we don't want people to know what we're really feeling. And the whole world, it looks like it moves on, and they have no idea what, what's going on in our lives. And so we hide it because we're ashamed, because we're embarrassed. Sometimes um, if we're a believer of Jesus, we don't want people that we don't have enough faith. Ooh. And, but God can, God can right. handle our grief. God, uh, God understands our that loss. That's crazy, isn't it? How, how we hide it from everybody. There's a lot of reasons. And you guys keep answering those reasons. You know, if, if, if uh, you experience lo- grief and loss, it's a different kind of pain. And I mean, if you were hit by a car, you'd be injured and you'd be visible, right? But grief and loss isn't always visible. And we're just walking wounded when we're suffering through grief and loss. So instead of being vulnerable with each other, a lot of times we tend to hide it. And we do this in a lot of ways ways because we're shielding ourselves. We're creating a defense mechanism to manage the pain. And it's a very human thing to do. Don't be ashamed if you've done this. But we create defense. It's just be aware of it. We create defense mechanisms. You know, one of the ones we do is we blame others. When something, we lose something, we try to look for who's responsible. We're going to pin it on somebody. We're going to blame doctors. We're going to blame other people. We're going to blame God, we'll blame the government, whatever we can blame it on, because that, that kind of gets the pain away from us and puts it on somebody else. Or we'll blame ourselves. Oh, it's my fault. I've been there, you know. Or we just deny it. Oh, I'm fine. No, nothing's wrong. We just deny the loss, right? Like, it, like uh, oh, no, I, just because I'm bleeding out of my soul, it doesn't matter. Nothing's wrong. Or we distract ourselves. We'll go back to work too soon. Mm-hmm. We'll, we'll change the subject yeah. when somebody mentions it, right? Or we'll get hostile because that's a great defense mechanism, right? When somebody mentions it, we'll get angry or irritable whenever it's mentioned, right? And that, that'll shut down people right away. Or we intellectualize it. We don't face our emotional side. We'll just keep all in our, our intellectual side of our brain, you know? We'll analyze it. We'll go about I- information. We'll have theories about it, but just don't let it hit our heart. Or we'll minimize it. Oh, you know, others have it worse will rationalize it. You know, people die every day. You know, I'm not depressed. I'm just down a bit. You know, spiritually mature people understand that grief and loss and pain is a part of life. And so is the ability to express it. Emotionally mature people express their grief and loss and pain. And Job was this incredible follower of God, so devoted that he loses it all. And if you read through those chapters, you can watch him lament. He cries out in grief and loss. And he even cries to God, why was I even born? It had been better if I had never been born, God. And it's a reminder to us that it's okay to feel that grief and loss and to be overcome with sorrow when we do lose it. God took it from Job. God can take it from you. You know, in order to grow up, we must deal with our grief and loss. So our next question for you, and you can answer it in the in the comments, and you'll all have a variety of answers. And this question, just to kind of help you learn from one another and just to kind of help you think, but the question is this, what is the best way to handle grief? That's a really big question. You know, how, how do we handle the grief that surrounds us, the loss that surrounds us, and anything that maybe you've learned along the way that you can share with other people? You know, Job, he, he lamented, as Michael said. It was a passionate expression of grief. Why was I even born? You know, and all of us, we need to think about the, the how is it possible for us to grieve in a spiritually healthy way. And the truth is that this grief is going to transform us. Transformation comes when we grieve. Transformation comes with loss. And on the other side of grief and loss, we are never the same. And in the midst of it, it is holy 
sacred interior work. But we have to warn you that there'll be others as you're going through your grief and loss journey who want to play God, or who <laughs> want to speak for God. Job had that happen. Yeah. I mean, he had, he, he had friends who told him that he was in the situation because of his sinfulness. Mm. And the reason all that bad stuff was happening to him is he didn't fast and he didn't pray enough. And a lot of times, you know, people will say to us, you know, well, if you're angry, I mean, you ever been angry if you lost somebody? Well, isn't, isn't that a perfectly human response that you lost them? People be, oh, that's a sin. You can't be angry. That's not true. Or, or if you're confused and, and you don't even, you know, you're like, how could God allow this to happen? People will say, well, that's a lack of faith. Oh, that's so hard. And, and, then, if you, and then if you're sad, they'll be like, well, you just need, to, you, can, you can pray your sadness away. Or maybe if you read more Bible. You just get in your Bible more. Yeah. Now, in some ways, that's just such a ridiculous thing to say someone who is walking wounded, who is hurting, who is aching. You know, Jesus himself, who knew about faith, who certainly knew about not sinning in your life, who knew about prayer, who knew about the power of the scriptures like anyone else, Jesus had a friend die. And in John 11.35, scripture tells us when the friend died, Jesus wept. That's an embarrassing moment. The expressions of our grief is perfectly human and our God understands it and in the midst of all this a transformation occurs while we wait on God you see Job had to wait all these things happened and then he had to wait and that waiting on God in the midst that's where the transformation occurs and then you'll be in a liminal space and maybe you've never heard that word the word liminal means it's an in-between space you know you're in between in what life was you've had the loss but you're not where life is, is going to be. Mm. And there are no easy answers. Grief is hard work. I always say grief is work. It is work. And no one can go through it for you. You have to go through it. And everyone's grief journey is unique. It's individualized, just as God's love for all of us is individualized. And so you have to wait. When I experienced a loss in my life, I wanted it to be over. I, I wanted it to be finished. So I acted like I was fine. I went back to work, as Michael said, way too fine, and way too soon when I should have gone to work. And, you know, I, I, sometimes I say, like, it's kind of like I put a Band-Aid on a shotgun wound. And it, it took me months, just months of this liminal and this waiting. And I can remember going down the stairs at the church I was serving at the time, and I had this thought. And that morning I thought to myself, months and months later, I thought, oh, my goodness, I feel like me. <laughs> and that's how it works in this grief journey. It just takes time. You know, one of my favorite scriptures is a scripture that says this, after you've suffered a while, God himself will restore you. And you know what? That'll happen in our lives, and it also happened in Job's life. In the midst of, in midst of his loss, in the midst of his lament, in the midst of that, a restoration was coming. Scripture tells us this. After Job had prayed for his friends, the Lord restored his fortunes and gave him twice as much as he had before. All his brothers and sisters and everyone who had known him before came and ate with him in his house. They comforted and consoled him over all the trouble the Lord had brought to him. The Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life more than the former part. After this, Job lived 140 years. He saw his children and their children to the fourth generation. And so Job died, an old man, and full of years. Full of years. It's powerful. You see, grief and loss transforms us. It brings an authenticity to us. I mean, we get real about our emotions. We get real about pain and loss. We get really real if someone's experiencing it for us to be able to look at them and say, me too. It transforms us when it comes to brokenness. I mean, we see brokenness in humanity in a different light because we've been broken. We can see the pain in the world. We get a new grasp on humility <laughs> that, that we're, not, we're not the center of the universe. You know, four times after Job loses everything, God refers to Job as my servant. Mm -hmm. There's something powerful in that. And then we learn the power of grace, that everyone around us is going through something. After that tragedy, you would think that Job might have wanted to take revenge on the friend who told him it was all his fault. You know what he does? He blesses them. And then our capacity to love is increased. 
We embrace life's imperfections. We embrace others' imperfections and our own. And we have a renewed understanding of the power of the gift of this life. And then we learn to trust. You know, sometimes I don't know how people handle the grief and loss that enters their life. I don't know how they do it. But when you've gone through a loss, you do develop trust because you have the confidence that no matter what you have to face, God will be with you. You see, if we grieve God's way, we are forever changed. But you know what? When you experience grief, when you experience loss, don't just get over it. Let it bless you. Allow it to transform you. Because after you've suffered a while, God himself will restore you. And when God restores you, I promise you, you will never be the same. You will be transformed. If we're going to grow up, we must deal with our grief and loss. You know, uh, every week we try to offer you some next steps that you can do to to help you grow in your faith and become that grown-up that God wants us to be. Uh, Our next steps for this week is I want to attend a mental health first aid course on Saturday, October 22nd at 8 a.m. We we talked about how mental health is part of our church's, uh, one of our church's strategic goals to bring mental health care to this area, and this is the beginning of it. This is how we can start to be involved in this. And the second next step is I am, so make, make sure you mention that in the comments. If you want to be part of that, mention that in the comments. And the second thing is I am interested in a grief support group. Deal with your grief with other people. It's great when you do. Other people that are going through the same thing, they get it. They understand the pain and the loss. So be a part of a grief support group that's starting here at Heritage Church. And the final thing is, is I want to put my trust in Jesus. Jesus suffered everything that we suffered. And yet he did not sin. He did his life so that we could have an example of how to do ours. And that's why we follow Jesus. And if you'd like to be baptized, it's a rebirth into this way of being. Now, if you'd like to give to Heritage Church, there are three ways to give. You can give through the website. You can text an amount to 84321. Or you can just mail something into the church. We're glad that uh, the people who consider Heritage Church their church home give faithfully to it and we thank you all for that for those of you that are guests or first time online with us today don't feel like you need to give this service is our gift to you and one of the things we want to kind of lift up to everybody every week is that we want you to invest in people in your you're we're supposed to love our neighbors invest in your neighbors invite them to be a part of what the church is doing because the church is that those people that are going to pull them towards god and include them in what you do for god So invest, invite, include. That's our job as Christians to our neighbors. So we're glad you're here with us this week. I'll remind you that our in-person services, in case you like to uh, come one week and you're feeling like it, they're at 9 and 10 a.m. in person. We continue to stream at 11 a.m. You can please drop your prayer requests in the chat. We'll be faithful to pray for those. And let us know if you need any anything. Would you join me in prayer as we get ready for our music portion of our service? God, we love you. And God, we thank you that you are a God who understands grief and loss. Jesus wept, and so will we. I'm grateful that your word says that the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. God, let us know that We do not grieve alone, that you are with us, and that in the midst of the valley of grief, in the valley of pain, in the valley of loss, that you are working in us, and you will transform us, and you will restore us. God, most of all, let us be mindful that we do not grieve as people without hope. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. We hope you all enjoy the music. Love you all. Have a great week. Love you all. Bye-bye.